where we show you how you can find out what other people really think and feel, but in a way that is scientifically validated and practical. My guests are leading subject matter experts in their respective fields and include scientists, law enforcement and practitioners. Today I have the pleasure to talk to Avinoam Sapir, one of the biggest names when it comes to deception detection. Avinoam holds a BA in Psychology and Criminology from the University of Bar Ilan and an MA in Criminology from the University of Tel Aviv. He is a former lieutenant from the Israeli Police Department and he owns a company called Laboratory for Scientific Interrogation in Phoenix, Arizona. But most important for our discussion today, Avinoam is the creator of the Scientific Content Analysis, a technique to analyze texts or spoken communication for deception and other attributes and traits. If you're serious about finding out what people really think and feel, then the scientific content analysis is a tool that deserves your attention. Avinon teaches his technique to law enforcement and interested practitioners around the globe and emphasizes that no man can hide the truth in an open statement. One only has to know what to look for. This interview is longer than most on this channel, but it is so packed with gems and insights, not to mention all the practical tips, that any further cuts would not do it justice. Now take a seat, lean back, watch and learn. Avinoam Sapir, thank you so much for, for joining this, uh, this little conversation. I'm really, I'm really fascinated to have this uh, discussion today with you. Um, most informed and interesting, of course, for our discussion here is you are the creator of SCAN, uh, Scientific Content Analysis. So before we come into, un, into SCAN and what's possible and the whole history of, of it, I think it's worth underlining that when it comes to deception detection, which is the overall theme for our discussion here, within that field, you are one of the absolute subject matter experts. It has to do with your, with your uh, past occupations, with your experience, and of course with the, the methods that you have devised, the scientific content analysis. Before we dive into that, I would like to probe something uh, with you. How shall I say this? What makes the verbal part of deception detection so interesting uh, for you and how did you come on the topic? Uh, I started my uh, move uh, into scan actually by teaching interviewing. And the main point in interviewing, and because you are also interested in negotiations, the main point in interviewing is the less you ask, the more you get. Okay? There is a problem with questions. Uh, questions uh, tend to, I, I, I co equate questions to the periscope of the submarine. And there are two problems with the periscope of the submarine. Uh, number one, it's limited view. So if you use questions, you only get what you know. What you don't know, you will never get. Uh, number two uh, with questions, is that uh, once the submarine takes out the periscope, you are not a submarine anymore. So once you start to use questions, uh, you teach people what you know, you teach people what you don't know, and you teach people how to lie. So the, the, the main point is, uh, because I was teaching interviewing practically how not to ask questions, I mean, how to get information without using questions. So, th therefore, gradually, I moved into what you do with the information that you get. Now, if you realize it, because you are t talking here about uh, detecting deception, there is a major difference between getting information via questions and getting information via statements. Uh, when I say statements, I mean free flow. I mean, when a person talking free flow, it is a point to realize that rarely, if ever, people are really lying. I mean, it's a question, how do you define a lie? If you say that a lie, by the way, there is a very interesting point, because there is a gap between the legal definition of a lie versus the social definition of a lie. If you go to court and you testify, they ask you to, uh, to take an oath that you are going to be truthful, and nothing but the truth, and all of it, right? Now, but socially, uh, to give part of the truth is not considered lying. 
How many times do we defend ourselves to even relatives, friends, and we tell them, I didn't lie to you, I, ju I just didn't tell you. If you were to ask me, I would have told you. So actually, if you realize now that when you do, deal with statements, and by the way, scan deals practically mostly with statements. So if you deal with statements, rarely favor people are lying. They might, might be misleading you, but they are misleading you with the true story. So if you are looking for deception, you are looking in the wrong place. What you need to look for is what the person doesn't tell you. And what the person doesn't tell you will take the story upside down 180 degrees. So the, the main point is, uh, most of my, um, uh, how would I call it, most of my focus going over text is not to find deception. Most of my focus is to find the story behind the story, meaning the story that the person doesn't tell me. And as a matter of fact, if you go over, uh, uh, the more statements you go over, you, you start to realize that practically everything is in the story. If you take, a, for example, if you take a, a statement of one page, one page is going to tell you everything, not only about the event that the person is talking about, but one page is going to tell you even about the person who wrote the story. I mean, people don't realize when you come to write a story or to give a story orally, you are not only giving the story. You are using, there, is a, there are two stages here. One is to give the story and one is to phrase the story. Now, phrasing the story is the person, it's not the story. So it's a question, how can you find out from the way the person structures sentences and from the way the person chooses vocabulary, how can you find out a lot about the person? It is a, an interesting point. I mean, you can find, actually, uh, during the last several years, if you give me an anonymous letter, which is over one page, just over one page, I can tell you who wrote the letter. It's a very time consuming, but you would be able to know who wrote the letter. Yeah. Yeah. You, said, you said quite a number of, of interesting things um, and I, I'm, I, I took some notes. I will come back to them. But first, people think they have control over their words, right? So what's your, what's your take on this? <laughs> That's a philosophical question. That's a very interesting point. And what you are telling me, is it a question? Does the person control language or does the language controls the person? Now, the main point is there is enough evidence to, to show that language controls the person and not the person controls the language. I mean, you are not familiar with it. I don't know if you are bilingual, but even if you are bilingual, you are only bilingual with European languages. But if you, for example, I tell you, uh, I, uh, if, well, early in life, I studied Arabic, okay? Arabic is a very emotional language. Arabic is a language that emphasizes the beauty of the language, not so much the content. So it comes to a point that when you start to talk Arabic, uh, you very quickly forget what you want to say. Even though you are a Western person, by the way, that's a very interesting, you are a Western person with a Western mind, but, uh, but if you will talk Arabic, very soon you will think like an Arab. Uh, people don't realize it, that language controls the person, not the person controls the language. I, I will show you an example. Let's say that you write a letter, okay? You, let, you write a letter to friends, relatives, okay? Uh, and let's say you wrote a page and you are ready to ship the letter, okay? But before you ship the letter, you tell yourself, I would like to read the letter again, so I would like to make sure that the letter came good, all right? I have a question for you. Did you ever find yourself telling yourself, that's not the letter I really wanted it to be? If you find it, that you told yourself that that's not the letter you wanted to, to be, then I have a question for you. Who wrote the letter? That's an interesting one. Who wrote the letter? And if you realize that very soon, very soon, by the way, it takes four or five sentences for the person to lose control over the writing. It doesn't take that long. By the way, four or five sentences. As a matter of fact, for me, if a person will write the statement at home, 
and he will provide it to me by email, it's like I interview the person face to face. Because once the person starts writing, it's over. For example, let me show you. For example, if you take the statement, the athlete in South Africa who killed his girlfriend. Now, the statement that he produced to the police, he didn't write it at the police. He wrote it at home with his lawyer. But when you go over the statement, Regardless that if he wrote it at home with his lawyer, it comes across that he killed his girlfriend. Uh, just from his statement. It's a very interesting one. I mean, if you know that you killed somebody and you write a story, you are dead on arrival. As a matter of fact, nothing will help you. Even if you take somebody to help you write the story, nothing will help you. It's a very interesting one. I'm going over books, okay? I went over books, uh, I put it, uh, by the way, it's, uh, I wrote a book about comparing the intelligence services of Israel and the U.S. And uh, the main point is, I went over books by chiefs of intelligence. Now, if you read the books, you understand that they are telling you so much that even, but then you, you wonder, they are producing secrets into the books, but you wonder, just a minute, but the books were reviewed by a certain committee to make sure that no secrets will come out. But if you, but I tell you what's the problem with the review. The review, what they don't, don't realize, that page 300 will expose a secret on page 1. They don't realize it. Because the tendency is to read statements left to right. Language is not only left to right. Language is only top to the bottom. But when you review secrets, you review them only left to right, and therefore you will not see anything. But if you read it, what I call 360 degrees, going over the story from above, you see everything. So the language controls, but I wouldn't say language, but the story controls the person. Uh, I, many years ago, when I was still in Polygraph, I read a book by a well-known uh, psychiatrist. In the first page, he said, verbal is not reliable. Non-verbal is reliable. That's what he said. Uh, I told myself, just a minute, let me check if it's true. Okay, I went to check if it's true. And it, actually, after so many years that he brainwashed people that non-verbal is more reliable, he changed his mind. In his 60s, he changed his mind. Now he says that non-verbal is unreliable, that verbal is reliable. So the question is, uh, uh, it's a very interesting one. If you, the main, the main problem is when you use nonverbal communication, you are bombarded by all the outside environment that is out of the world. So the question is, should I look upon the person uh, or should I just take the words that the person is using? It's a very interesting point. Uh, all in all, if I would take the words, I would do a lot better. Uh, not only that one, tell you what's the problem with uh, nonverbal. Nonverbal means that you need the person in the room. If you go by verbal, I can take statements from 100 people at one time yeah. because I don't need to be there. So I agree that there is more to language than just the words. There is the sound, the pitch, the pace. There is a lot into language beyond the words. But if you realize that the words is so much, so much, you wouldn't need beyond the words. Yeah. There's, a, there's a really a massive uh, discussion going on between nonverbal and verbal communication. Yeah? But if you take this in the context of deception detection, then it kind of narrows down. I think the overwhelming scientific evidence points in the direction that you, there is no universal uh, deception cue that can reliably indicate deception. It's just not there. Pinocchio's nose does not exist. On the other hand, there is really great potential in the language that people use because that's a communication channel that paradoxically people overestimate the level of control that they have on it. I always mention James Pennebaker's uh, research here. He makes a distinction between function words and content words, which are processed in different parts of the brain, whereby function words like uh, pronouns, articles, etc., etc., are uh, escaping our voluntary control. And hence, 
these type of words can really be indicative of, uh, of deception. Let's just say nonverbal communication can tell us many things, yeah? but specifically if we, if we narrow it down to deception detection, um, I do tend to agree with scientists and, and practitioners in the field like, like you that the verbal channel of communication, as paradox as it might uh, sound, has greater potential. I think I heard Mark McClitch saying, we have to believe what's said, even if we know that the person is lying. And he meant by this specific, the specific words that the, that the speaker is using, these are the words that we have to listen for. Well, there are two points. Okay, there are two points now. Uh, one, uh, because you mentioned the uh, language is divided into two. Uh, number one is what is called the objective language, meaning that's the language that is true to everyone meaning the, the, the language is imposing on you how to use it. And you mentioned the pronouns. I mean, if you say I and I say I, it will be the same, the same meaning. We don't need to ask people what do you mean I, okay? Uh, but there is another component of language which is practically open. That's what they call it in grammar. It's called open, closed versus open. Open means... Uh, that everyone attributes different meanings to the same words. For example, if I would say, uh, I got up, uh, what does it mean to get up? Uh, get up means that you got out of bed. Uh, how many people will tell you that they didn't get up before they had two cups of coffee? And they, before they had two cups of coffee, they are officially irresponsible to what they do. So what does it mean to get up? Uh, what does it mean to go to sleep? Uh, that also is it's an issue. I mean, every activity that you have is everyone has a different interpretation to it. So when you listen to people, uh, the tendency is to listen to people with your language. But they are not using your language, they are using their language. So it takes a while to realize that practically, even if, let's say, we right now we speak English. Uh, so, but my English might be different from your English. So we are assuming that we understand each other, but there might be some points here and there, not, not, not all over, but here and there, there might be some points that we are using uh, language which true only to that person, only true to that person. The, the, there is, a, and once you realize it, then you realize that the person is not lying to you. I mean, uh, assume, if you assume that the people are lying, it's only because you are rejecting their language, which is not your language. So your logic tells you that what they say does not fit what you are thinking in your language. But if you are assuming, practically what I'm saying is, in a way, you d need to diminish yourself in order to understand what the person is talking. And uh, it is. Uh, it takes a while to realize that we are. We might be facing uh, two different languages. Actually, I equate uh, dealing with the language uh, to dealing with codes, uh, because practically the only difference between a code and language that in a code you know you face a code. I mean, you don't read it, you don't understand it, so you face a code. Uh, but in language, you don't realize you face a code. So you think you understand it. And because you think you understand it, you are really falling. You are, you are f not falling, you are failing, actually, to understand what the person is saying. Uh, and as a matter of fact, the more the person contradicts reality, the more you need to realize that the person is using not your language. Because it contradicts reali reality according to you, but according to him, it doesn't. That's the main point. You see, I trust uh, what the person is telling me. Uh, that, that's very interesting. I, I do accept what the person is telling me, not because what, what he told you, that even if the person is lying, because he is wrong, the person is not lying. Uh, the, the, the point is that the person is truthful, but he is not completely truthful. But the main point is, beyond not being completely truthful, is also using his language, not your language, and therefore it looks to you like the person is lying. But if you take, for example, exactly what the person is saying, 
I mean, word for word, I mean, exactly what the person is saying. You will realize that in most cases, they are not lying to you. Uh, so they, 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 are misle- they might be misleading me. And when you take, for example, let me show you. Let's take a very brief statement that a, a wife who killed her husband gave to the police. And she said, it was only three sentences. She said, I was in the living room. I heard the shot. And I went to see what happened, and I found it was dead. So now, if you take just what she said, uh, did she lie? The answer is no, she didn't lie. Because was she in the living room? Yes, yeah, she was in the living room. Did she hear a shot? Of course she heard a shot. Because you shoot somebody, you hear a shot. Now, did she go to make sure that she managed to, to kill him? Yes, yeah, she wanted to make sure that she managed to kill him. So the only problem is that after she gave this brief story, the detective for six hours told her that she is lying. And for six hours, she looked straight in, into his eyes and she told him, but I'm not lying to you. Everything I told you is true. And everything she said was true. So the main point is, uh, he, he assumed that she is lying. Actually, I make my living because people think that guilty people are lying. Guilty people are not lying. That's the bottom line. If you realize that they are not lying, you are in good shape. And as a matter of fact, uh, they might be misleading, but they are not lying. It's a question, how do you define a lie? That's what I started. If you lie by omission, it is a lie legally, but it is not a lie socially. So, I mean, there, there, are, there, there, there is a gap between the definitions of a lie. So we are assuming that people are lying. People are not lying. For, if you take exactly what they tell you, you will realize that what they tell you is true. Yeah. So again, you said uh, quite a number of things that are absolutely supported by scientific evidence. We do know that most people avoid outright ri- lies if they can. We do know that uh, omissions is by far the preferred means of deception. And again, especially interested in, in corporate context, yeah, in negotiations. Yeah. I did my own research. Right. In regards to omissions, there are quite a number of, of different strategies, ambiguity, concealment, dodging questions, equivocation, evasions, half-truths, vagueness, etc., etc. These are all types of omissions. And these are the preferred means of bending the truth, so to say. Yeah? Not to mention the fact that uh, there is plausible deniability. You said it, you said it just. Uh, socially, it's much more accepted, so the risk for a professional negotiators to an outright lie is much higher than, than just an omission. Yeah? And the same is true in, in the more general uh, and uh, public context. Yeah? So you're absolutely right. Now, I would like to share with you one point. When I was, uh, because you mentioned negotiations, uh, when I was uh, teaching interviewing, I told my students that when you listen to the subject, don't concern yourself with the next sentence that you will say. Don't bother with it. Don't bother with the next question you will ask. Don't bother with the next sentence you will say. Because when you are preoccupied with the next question, you don't really listen. What I told them, when the person is talking, you shut your brain down and you listen to what the person is saying. And the question will come naturally. Naturally, if you will just float with the words the person is saying, you will do great. But the main point is, most people, if you think about negotiations or interviewing, most people prepare themselves for the, for the session. So they read a lot, they read a lot, they want to know everything about the person they will be facing, and they would like to know everything about the corporation that they will be facing. Uh, but the main point is, once they get there, they are, they are so preoccupied with the file that went over that they don't even notice what the person is saying. Uh, in a way, what I'm saying is, there are two issues here. One is outside knowledge, and one is inside knowledge. Now, when you talk with people, you need to set out of the window the outside knowledge. You are now going by what the person is telling you. If you will float with what the person is telling you, you will do a lot better, a lot better. And when the person is talking, the less you will talk, the more you will get. Because the main point is, information is power. I mean, we understand that one. Information is power. The more you know, the better the decision you will make how to present your position. 
So if you take, a, you take a negotiation session, you can measure it very simply if it was good on your part or not. How do you do it? You just measure how long you talked versus how long the other one talked. If you talk 50-50, you are in major trouble because 50-50, there is no way to get information by 50-50. The less you talk, the more you will get. So, and if you talk more than the other person, you are officially in deep, deep trouble because practically you expose yourself to the other one. So the main point is, that it's a, by the way, it's objective measurement to measure the session. I mean, just measure how long each one of the two were talking. Now, we are talking here between the two of us because we want to know more about scans. So therefore, <laughs> therefore you need me to talk a lot. But what, and when you talk with negotiations, that's the opposite from interview. Uh, no, that's the opposite from what we have right now because in the negotiations, you want the other side to talk a lot more because the more the other side will talk, the more you will know. But, you, but, but even when you listen to it, and I have, I have uh, investigators who take my class and they suddenly get so, so much information out of, out of the subject. But the main point is, it's not that I, 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 I would I say, my class is not teaching people how to get information. It's not. My class is teaching people how to exhaust the information that they already get. It's not the question what people are saying. It's a question how do you use what they are saying. So if you listen to people with your language, with your knowledge, you will be losing. You will, absolutely you will be losing. So you talk about negotiations. You want tips about negotiations? The less you talk, the more you get. And, if, uh, and the main point is don't think about the next question you will ask the person. Just float with what the person is saying. You will do great. You will really do great because, let me tell you, find me anybody who doesn't want to talk. I mean, by the way, the FBI did the statistics. They found out that only 4% of the American population will invoke the right to remain silent. Only 4%, 96%. And by the way, in the U.S., you realize they tell per the person, you have the right to remain silent. Everything you will say will be used against you. In Israel, by the way, not only you need to give the rights before the interview, when the person starts to confess, you need to give him the rights again. And still they will talk with you. I mean, the main point is actually preventing a person from talking is considered torture. How do we know that we are alive? How do we know that we are human beings? Because we talk. I mean, we human beings love to talk. That's what it is. So the main point is, you don't need to bring people to talk. You don't need to. But what you need to is to listen very carefully to what they say. And when you listen to them, don't listen with your language. By the way, I tell my students, you need to have a banner on the top of the wall behind the subject. Remember, it's not lying to you. It just doesn't tell you everything. You said again a couple of interesting things. Um, listen, that, that's so true. Uh, also my own uh, research, people do not listen, even experienced managers. And I think that's a, a, great, uh, a great shortcoming here. So in preparation to our conversation here, yeah, you were kind enough to provide me with some readings and I have read them and we said we will not mention them due to their sensitivity, so I, don't, I, I, I will not. However, I, may, I noticed something. So in some of those techniques, also in scientific content analysis, I believe I read from you that you don't need any context, right? However, in the reading, in the reading material that you gave me, you have considered to a quite surprising degree the content, right? You even compared different books with, with each other. So how, how important is context in the context, if that makes sense, of scientific content analysis? Because, for example, I sent you a paper that it is based upon two books. Uh, now, but you realize there are two books that are written by the same person. So practically, I don't need to know uh, anything about the person because one book will expose everything. The, the main point is people tell us everything. 
And we are bombarded with so much information. It's only a question how we can process all of it in our brain. I mean, there is so much around. I mean, it's, it's the most untapped source of information is what the person is telling us. We don't even use it. We, most of the time we don't use it. I would like to share with you one point, one point. Uh, I met a professor in college and uh, in Canada. And he asked me, what do I do for a living? And I told him, uh, language statements. And he said, what's that? He said, what's that? And I told him, okay, you know what? I will tell you the secret. <laughs> I told him, I'll tell you the secret. The secret is that people really don't lie. And what you need to find out is what they don't tell you. And I, and I, I told him, and you know what bothers me? Till today, what really bothers me, I don't understand why a person can kill and a person cannot lie. I mean, it doesn't make any sense in my mind. You already kill somebody, and killing a person, it's the top of crime. So you already went to the top, but you cannot lie? I mean, what's the punishment for lying? What's the punishment for killing? I mean, it doesn't make any sense. Why a person who killed cannot lie? And he told me, I will tell you why. <laughs> he said, I will tell you why. Uh, unbelievable. Look what he said. He said, ask yourself, how many times in your life people told you not to lie? And how many times in your life people told you not to kill? He said, that's your answer. It's a very interesting one. By the way, what he said is true. I mean, all the time they tell us not to lie, not to lie, not yeah. to lie. But nobody tells us not to kill. Maybe we should put on the highway a billboard every 10 miles, don't kill, don't kill. So you drive, you drive from one city to another. After several drives like that, you will be brainwashed not to kill, right? I mean, according to him. But the main point is, it's very true. I mean, people can kill and people can... By the way, let me show you. Uh, if you catch somebody that lied, who lied to you, that person is finished. You will not be able to talk with that person ever in your life. But how many times do we understand when a person kills somebody, we understand it? I mean, we say, look, they, uh, for example, people who were abused, they killed the abuser. So we say, oh, yeah, makes sense. Makes sense to us. I mean, the fact that they took life, that's another story. But, but we understand them. So there are so many murders that we understand, but we will never understand even one lie. That's a very interesting point. Because the, the, uh, all our, how would I call it, all our communication is based upon basic trust. If you are taking basic trust out of the picture, there is no way to communicate between people. None whatsoever. By the way, I remember when I was in the military, there was one young officer. When you told her good morning, she said, are you sure? <laughs> I mean, that's what, that's what, that was her answer. Are you sure it's good morning? I mean, it's unbelievable. But we assume that if somebody tells you good morning, you say good morning back, you know, you don't really dispute it. You don't dispute it. The main point is there is so much in communication that is based, based upon basic trust. And if you erode this basic trust, there is no way to talk with people. And that's why when you catch somebody lying to you, that person is out of the window. You will never be able to talk with that person ever in your life. Brings me to a question which I have in my mind to ask you since about, I think, 10 years when I became first aware about you. And that's the question. You have been a polygrapher, right? How, how long have you been polygrapher? Right. How long? For 10 years. For 10 years. So what, I mean, there must be some key observations that you must have had that sparked this whole journey into scientific content analysis. What, what were those observations that, that told you there must be something more uh, in, in connection with language? I will give you one example. And it is not my example. It is an example about another pol a polygrapher of a state police in the U.S. So he polygraphed a guy uh, for a robbery, robbery of a store. And the guy came deceptive. So the, the, the polygrapher told the suspect, you are lying. He said, look, you came out deceptive on the polygraph. 
And the suspect said, how can it be? Because I was not even in that store. That's what he said. How can it be? I was not even in that store. So the, the polygopher, when he told me the story, he said, you know, I really wanted to strangle him. I mean, how can he say such a brazen lie? How can he say? He came the safety of the polygraph, and now he tells me he was not in that store. So he said, I caught myself. Now look what he said. I caught myself, and I told him, if you were not in that store, what did you do? He said, I was in the getaway car. So what I come to tell you, on the polygraph, you ask a direct question. Did you rob the store? He says no, and he fails the test. But when you come to him later, and he said, I was not in that store, that's a very specific denial. He didn't say, I didn't rob the store. He said, but I was not in that store. So now, if you will flow with what he says, then you realize that you will get a confession. Because the person is not really lying. He's truthful. He was not in that store. But he was still robbing the store. Because legally, if you are in a getaway car, you rob the store. I mean, and he knows it. By the way, he knows it. It's not like criminals don't know the law. I mean, of course they know the law. So the, the main point is, when you go over, uh, uh, you need to distinguish between the polygraph session itself, meaning the time that you run the, the machine, versus before and after. Because during the, the test itself, the person will be deserted. Because you ask specific questions. Did you do whatever? Did you take part in doing it, whatever? So you ask specific questions, and he is lying. Right? Now, but before that and after that, the, then that's a different story. That's a different story. Because that's how I started. I told you there are two different issues. Do you get information as answers to questions? Or do you get information which is free flow with no questions? So when you go over specific answers to specific questions, the person might be deceptive. By the way, I had a lady in my, in my class. She came to me when I, when I told her that people are not lying. They don't say everything. She, she came to me and she said, I don't know what you talk about, but my daughters lie to me all the time. I told her they are not lying to you. She said, oh, yeah, they are lying to me. So I asked her, what's the problem? He said, well, this evening I need to go and grill them because I got a virus in my computer, and I know that one of them did it because they are the only two people there. And I know that if I will ask them if they did it, they will say no, and one, one of them must be deceptive. And I told her, that's the main point. You are not allowed to ask them. What you need to do is to go back home, and you will tell them only one line. Just one line, you will say. And once you say this one line, you shut up and you don't say anything. And after that, they will not lie to you. I told her, go back home and you will tell them. I got a virus in my computer and I wonder how it got there. That's what you say. That's it. Finish. Shut up. And the next morning she came to me. She said, it's unbelievable. It's the first time in my life they didn't lie to me. She said, I came back home. And only my youngest was there. And I told her, I got a virus in my computer. I wonder how it got there. She said, Mom, it's not me, it's the other one. Wow, that was progress. The oldest one came back home. She said, I got a virus in my computer. I wonder how it got there. She said, Mom, I'm so sorry. I just downloaded music from the internet and it came with the music. I told her, you see, if you ask them questions, you force them to lie. By the way, questions force the person to lie. But if you don't ask them questions, why they would lie to you? It's only a virus. I mean, what's the story? Between children and parents? I mean, what's the big deal? The main point is, questions force people to lie. So when you ask people questions, you are acting against your own interest. Because your interest is not to find the person lying. Your interest is to get the information. That's what you want. So if you really want to get information from people, uh, let me say this way. I compare it to drinking decaffeinated coffee. You need to run a decaffeinated session 97% free of questions. 
because the less questions you will ask, the more you will get. And, and, and what you will get will be more reliable. Will be more reliable. Because once you ask questions, you force them to lie. That, that's the point. So we need to distinguish, because let's say that I'm running negotiation. And by the way, let me show you. Uh, when you see it on the TV, when somebody takes hostages and the police negotiator comes, and the first thing that the negotiator wants to do is to identify the criminal, <laughs> right? But, but, but that's wrong, because the a criminal, the criminal knows that they want to identify him, so he doesn't want to talk with him, right? But if he will start to talk with him about the weather, whatever, I mean, why wouldn't he talk with him? He cannot talk with the hostages. He really wants to talk with somebody. So the, the, if, he will, if he will move to use a very broad question, very broad question that does not relate to identity. For example, would you like to explain to me why you bother me today because I had my cup of coffee, now I have to talk with you. Would you like to, to explain to me why you did it today? That's, that's a question. Now, this is question is not threatening. It's not threatening because why he did it today, why should he care? I mean, it's not any evidence whatsoever. But the main point is, uh, once he starts talking, we are returning to what we said earlier. Does the person control language or does the language control the person? So if you start, you start the person moving to give you several sentences, he will trip and we will start exposing himself. That's the bottom line. That's the bottom line. That's what I told the lady about her daughters. Don't ask questions. That's the point. With, with your permission, yeah, I, I tried once more. Um, I would be really interested in your thought process once you observed certain, how shall I call them, uh, interesting verbal behavior in your career as, uh, as polygrapher that led you on the way of uh, designing uh, scientific content analysis. Uh, uh, the main point is, it's not polygraph that brought me oh. to reach scan. It's not. What brought me to reach scan was all my classes about interviewing. Uh, in my classes, I asked people to give two statements. One was a, a truthful one, and one was a deceptive one. Okay? Uh, and the main point is, uh, in, mo in most cases, by the way, the, the truthful one, I started to see patterns that came across, not everybody does say it. Not everybody does say it. I mean, it is a very interesting one. Uh, you need to realize, and but all over the globe, but it's very interesting. It is cross-culture, cross-country, cross-language. All over the globe, people give the same story. If I will ask everybody, what happened from the time you got up till the time you went to sleep? Right? So there is a, a certain, um, certain information that everybody will put in the story. But what happens if some, sometimes a person gives you a, 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 an activity that most people do not say? Okay? Uh, for example, uh, let's take a simple one. Right? Uh, if I if I would uh, ask you what happened from the time you got up to the time you went to sleep, and you give me the entire day, and then you come to the end of the story, and you say, I went to sleep. Okay? You say, I went to sleep. Now, it's a question, what does it mean, went to sleep? People think that went to sleep, it's like, what, boom, <laughs> you fell asleep. By the way, went to sleep can be an activity that took three hours. Because some people take a shower, some people, uh, some people read a book in bed. I mean, you know, they can read for one hour. I mean, they would not say that they read a book. They would say, I went to sleep. All right, but what happens if somebody in the story will say that he read a book? Now, you need to realize, now you are not facing reading a book. That's not true. What you are facing is that the person is telling you that reading a book in bed is important for him to include in the story. As a matter of fact, I found out, and it's close to 100%, I found out that everybody in a statement that will tell you that he read a book in bed, he has a problem to fall asleep. That's why it enters the story, because there are many people who read a book in bed, but they will not tell you that they read a book. 
So there are some activities that people are putting in the story, not because of the day. They are putting in the, the story because of their past. Let me say this way. There was, a, uh, a, in the Congress, uh, in the U.S., the, there was several, a few years ago, there was the uh, confirmation of the justice, Kavanaugh. Yes. yes right? And then a, a professor from California yeah. came and said that he tried to rape her. Yeah. Okay? And, uh, and uh, I'm not going into the entire story, but I will take only one point, just one point. And she said that, uh, that he jumped, she was in bed, he jumped on her, and he wanted to undress her. Look what she says now. But he couldn't undress her. And why? Because she has a batting suit under her. So this professor is telling me that she went to the party with passive defense against rape. Mm. That's what she's telling me in her story. I mean, who is the lady, a young lady, who goes to a party and she puts a batting suit under a dress so nobody will be able to undress her? Mm. So what she's reporting now, she is reporting her past. She is not reporting the, the present. That's not the present. That's not the event that night. It's not because she had a past that forced her to take measurements mm -hmm. against what happened to her previously. Now, I'm not saying, I'm not saying that what she's, uh, I'm not talking about the event that she reported to you, yeah. but what I'm telling you, she reported an event that the average uh, rape victim will not give you in a statement. I mean, who is the woman who goes to a party with a passive defense mechanism against rape. As a matter of fact, in the Middle Ages, they did use metal. Yeah. Uh, she used clothing, she used clothing. But the, but the point is, people don't, people don't really figure that what she is talking about is not the event she is talking about. She is talking about all her past experience that brought her to phrase the story. Mm -hmm. Even if she had such measurement, meaning the batting suit, why would she mention it? She doesn't need to mention it. I mean, there is a lot of stuff people don't mention in the story. I mean, you only tell us what you think is important for you to tell us. I mean, th that's about the mind. But she did put it in the story. And nobody cared. Nobody cared even to ask her about it. Because the main point is, uh, she had the past. So what does it mean she had the past? That's the question. So if you take, for example, and I found out in, in statements in classes, if people tell you they got undressed, or people tell you uh, at some points here and there, that the average person doesn't say, doesn't say. For example, let me tell you, let's say you will take a shower, all right? So what, what you will say? You say, I took a shower, all right? But how many people will tell you that they dry themselves with a the towel? Nobody. Mm. I mean, I'm not saying nobody, because during the years I had close to 20 people who, who said that one in a statement, in their statement. So, but what does it mean to kushar? To kushar is not one activity. It is a, a long list of minute activities that will establish taking a shower. But they don't say it. They say, I took a shower. So if you perceive a statement as a list of activities, you are losing. A statement is not a list of activities. A statement is a list of summaries that each activity is a summary. So during the years when I had these classes, I accumulated all these particular points that uh, they, some mentioned them, but the decisive majority did not. So when I saw something, by the way, it was over thousands of people, when I saw some, somebody suddenly showing me a point in the story that all these people before him did not mention, I went to talk with him. I want to talk with him. I really wanted to know what's going on now because it sounds uh, very uh, unimportant. I mean, what's the big deal? I mean, but, 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 but what does it mean reading a book in bed? It's not important, but it is important for him. That's why I put it in the story. Yeah. Uh, that, that's the point. Coming very briefly back, I don't know if you can answer that, yeah? but coming briefly back to Kavanaugh because I'm, I'm quite familiar with the case and we analyzed both him and her. What, what's, what's, what would be your um, analysis on, on her statement? 
Do you think it's rather true? Uh, or, or? Uh, uh, I saw, uh, let me say this way, mm. uh, I saw the statement that she uh, sent to the, if I'm not wrong, I don't want to commit myself, but she sent the original letter to the senator that eventually that senator brought her to be testifying in Congress. So the, 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 that was the original statement. The, the letter that she sent to the senator. Now, if you compare the letter she sent to the senator to the statement she gave in the Congress, you realize what happened in between. In between, she was interviewed extensively, and they managed to fill in all the gaps that she didn't put in, the ori in her original letter. So in her original letter, there is a huge gap. There is a huge gap in the story. I will tell you where the gap. The gap is from the time she entered the room till the time that she, he jumped on her, there is a total gap she doesn't give. Eh? It's from the time, from the time, from the door till the time he jumps on her in bed, it is a total missing, total missing. Eh? She said, I, I went into the room and he jumped on me on the bed. Eh? Boom, boom. I mean, so that is missing. Now, but when she came to the Congress, all the extensive interviewing filled in the gaps. So the point is, which statement we should look into? The one that she already got extensive class out to lie to people, or should we take the original letter that she sent to the senator, and that one was what I would call the original one that nobody asked her anything, and she decided to put that one, and that one is the one to look into. Okay, so I think you answered the and question. And that one tells me that she yeah. is uh, omitting a major, major po portion of the story. How did she get into the bed? We don't know. Yeah, so you said something interesting. You said uh, she was taught to lie. So I'm, I'm, I'm guessing you, you, uh, your conclusion is she, she is not truthful. No, 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 she is, okay, back again. Uh, in her original statement, mm -hmm. she is incomplete, truthful person. Mm -hmm. And that means that if I were to interview her after that one, mm -hmm. I would not ask any specific questions. Mm -hmm. I would say, you are at the door, go on. Meaning, I will not ask any question. Any question I will ask now will be very problematic very problematic. So uh, I'm not saying, I'm not saying that what she reported is deceptive. I'm not saying at all, because the original statement that she gave, she was on the bed and somebody jumped on her. It, the, maybe even he jumped on her. It, that, that's not the point. But the point is, how did she get into the bed? And that is missing. This is called a missing objective link which is a major, major event, by the way, uh, because it must be important to eject it out of the story. It must be important. So the, uh, I, I didn't look into his statement, and I didn't look into her statement in the Congress, but I did look into the statement that she sent to the senator, the, I mean the letter that she sent to the senator, and it is a very problematic uh, uh, statement. Let me say it this way. Uh, but that doesn't, uh, how would I say it? That, that doesn't, I will not label her by that letter. I will not label her as deceptive. Uh, I would only label that by that letter, we will not approach him to give a statement. Uh, before I will approach him, I will need her to fill the gaps without questions. Okay. Because any question I will uh, ask, will be teaching her how to lie. Uh, and, uh, and it is a point. Uh, go and figure out what really happened there. But, but the, the main point is most uh, lawyers uh, are trained to go with specific questions. They are not trained to go with open questions because they don't want to risk that the person will give information that they are not uh, predicting. Uh, let me say this way. But, but if you ask people to give uh, open statement, you will always do a lot better. Always do a lot better. So I didn't look into, uh, I just compelled 
the statement that she gave in the Congress and the statement she gave in the letter, and it is a day and night. So coming back to your analysis, also a statement, also scientific uh, content analysis to the technique itself. Yeah, um, I heard Peter Hyatt saying um, that he credits you for um, starting this type of methodology, right? And spawned by your technique, there are a number of others that have built on it. Yeah, one of which is statement analysis, Mark Litch, uh, psychological narrative analysis from Jack Schaefer, especially with his uh, text bridges. Then we have behavior analysis and interviewing uh, techniques from Steve Fornell. There's discourse analysis, there's forensic linguistics. Uh, they, are, they have built on, on your technique to some extent, right? And these are techniques that really look specifically on the words, also on the words that are uttered uh, on the subconscious level. But in addition to that, and th that's, that's where my question is leading here, there's also a technique called statement validity assessment. One, one of the component is criteria-based content analysis, which is kind uh, of... That's in Europe. That's in Europe. Yes, yes. Yes, uh, validity assessment. Yeah. Uh, the, the, the point is, let me say this way. Uh, the, the, I, I had a student uh, from Switzerland who came to study SCAM. And she's a psychologist, and she said that in Switzerland, the validity assessment is uh, accepted as evidence in court. But she herself said that it is a flip of a coin in terms of uh, detecting, uh, detecting if a person is truthful or not. The, the, uh, and there are, uh, uh, this is one of them, that's a profile of a statement. Uh, yes, uh, but that's not scan at all. Uh, let, let me say this way. Anyone who goes by open statement in the U.S. who teaches analysis of statements was my student. Make it clear yeah. before they start teaching. Mm -hmm. So the, uh, anyone that you mentioned was my student. Okay. Right? The only difference between them and me, I tell you what's the difference, because they took the class many years ago. But since then, as we say in Israel, a lot of water was moving through the Jordan River. <laughs> Although the Jordan River will be called in the U.S. a creek, not a river, but never mind. But the point is that um, uh, since then, and by the way, just recently, let me show you, just recently, I was asked to look into a statement that I looked 30 years ago. Uh, this is a guy in Philadelphia who confessed to murder, and uh, they wanted to know 30 years ago if the guy, if the confession is reliable or not. And as a matter of fact, even 30 years ago, I found out uh, by, by what he didn't say that he committed a murder, right? But then after uh, so many years, they released him from prison and on the assumption that he was pressured to confess and now he was suing the detectives who took the confession. Mm -hmm. right? So now the, the lawyer sent me this, the, the same text, by the way, the same text that I looked. And now I found out even much more during what I know today. Uh, I have a scale of sensitivity that you uh, figure what is the most sensitive point in the story. By the way, there is a scale and it is based upon two components. I don't want to <laughs> overburden you, but it is based upon two components in the language that if they show up together, they must show up together. Okay. If they show up together, it is a sensitive one. Okay. So, which, uh, which, you are can, those, which are those two components? Uh, uh, okay, uh, if we have time. Okay, the, the point is, let me show you. The point is, we ask the person what happened, right? Even a confession is what happened, right? Now, what happens if a person tells that as what didn't happen, okay? Meaning the person is branching out of the question without me prompting him to do so. So there are two ways to branch out of the question what happened. Number one is to tell me what didn't happen, all right? And number two, to tell me why something happened. Because I don't ask people why, I only ask people what, all right? They don't forget, there is what, and the person says why, and the person says what didn't. Now, if you are an investigator, and by the way, even if you are in negotiations, you wouldn't care, you wouldn't care what didn't happen. I mean, a sentence in the negative doesn't help you. All right? So the question is, why would a person give us a sentence in the negative? The answer is 
because it is important for him. That's why he gives it, because it doesn't really, uh, it doesn't do anything in the information, because it's something which didn't happen, right? So when you get a sentence in the negative, you need to wake up. You really need to wake up, because the person is branching out. Now, when a person gives you a reason, he also branches out, because what, did I ask him why? But he feels the need to justify himself. Uh, okay, to explain himself. So when you get these two together, meaning what didn't in conjunction to a reason, this is extreme sensitivity. Eh? Because he is branching twice out of the question. Use simple common sense. He is branching twice out of the question what happened. So when you, when you uh, let's say you are in negotiations and the person is talking, and now he gives you a sentence in the negative, and right away he puts also the reason. For example, because I didn't, because I didn't, because is a reason, didn't is negative, because I didn't. Wow. By the way, in a follow-up question, you need to zoom to that area of the language, because it is extreme sensitivity. He is branching out. Eh? Now, what happens? If a person in one paragraph, I mean, even if you listen, you can see it, that is giving you three negatives and two reasons. Wow, that goes to the roof. <laughs> that goes to the roof. Because practically, it doesn't tell me anything. I mean, he's talking in neutral right now. So anyway, when you, and this one, I only found in recent years, this uh, scale of sensitivity. So now I, I went over the same, the same text that I went 30 years ago, and, uh, and I saw that the, in the confession that what was sensitive for him was not the murder. What was sensitive for him is how to get rid of the body. So, by the way, this no police officer would be able to produce this scale of sensitivity into the text because they will not even think about it. Just, that's what I'm saying. They will not even think about it. It is absolutely something that no investigator will put it into the text. So and now we know that he, the confession is really true because all, all his uh, focus on sensitivity goes out to get rid of the body and not how he killed the body, how he killed the person. No, not whatsoever. It is, I mean, just one, two sentences, move on. And then he has a long section with all the sensitivity, how to get rid of the body. So what I'm saying is, uh, this particular point of scale of sensitivity, I didn't have it in uh, 1990, 30 years ago. And I can, <laughs> I mean, actually, it is a point to realize that uh, all these... Uh, uh, students of mine, they will not talk about it because they didn't have it then. Uh, the main point is I'm still going over text. And I, from the more text I go over, the more I'm learning. It's an unending process of learning. And now I'm going over books and I'm learning even much more so. I mean, because what is a book? A book is an open statement. So I sent you, I sent you the the three reports, and actually, the, I don't mind to, <laughs> to briefly talk about it. The Mueller report, if you want to, to know the Mueller report, the, there is a problem with the investigation uh, done by the FBI. There is a problem. And if you went over my report, uh, I only uh, relied upon emails. Uh, emails, there is no dispute what the person said. Now, the FBI does not, uh, does not tape and does not videotape interviews, does not. The FBI uh, openly, they say that they don't register, record anything that they talk with people, okay? Uh, as a matter of fact, in Canada, uh, a police cannot interview anybody without videotaping the interview, right? The FBI says, no, we are in business, we don't videotape anybody. But that's not that, the point. The point is that according to their internal regulations, the agent that conducted the interview has five days 
to write the summary of that interview. Five days. As a matter of fact, I remember one time when I testified in a semi-judicial panel over a confession that I got from a, a, a person, and uh, at that time, I didn't write everything, but I wrote right after the interview. Once the person went out of the room, I sat down to write what he said. And the judge asked me, just asked me, how long since he talked, you wrote the stuff? And I said, right away, right away. He said, how can I rely upon your memory that you wrote it accurately? Because you didn't write it right away. You wrote it uh, like the first sentence, I wrote it 10 minutes later, the, maybe the middle, five minutes later. But the main point, I didn't write it right away. So the FBI gives the agent five days to write the summary of that report. And they actually even prosecute people for lying to the FBI based upon a five-day delay writing the report of that interview. I mean, so actually what they found out, in, and I relied only upon emails. Emails rely because it's written. I have no dispute who said what. Okay. But they found out, if you go to the end of their, their, their uh, investigation, they found something very interesting. They found that there was no collusion, but there was obstruction of justice. So I have a question now. <laughs> yeah. Let's say somebody is truthful. Right? That, that's practically what they said, that he was truthful, but he obstructed the investigation. So what do you want a truthful person to do? To sit and start praying while they are trying to frame him? Uh, so the main point is, uh, if there is no collusion, how, ca how can there be obstruction? That's my point. You can only have obstruction if there was a collusion. I mean, you need to commit a crime before you obstruct justice. But if you don't commit a crime, how can you obstruct justice? Uh, it is practically that uh, conclusion that this distinguished lawyers put to the public is a joke. It is really a joke that they are telling the public that there was no collision, but there was obstruction. Go and figure. Go and figure. I mean, it's unbelievable. I've read, unbelievable. I've read all three of your reports with great interest and I encourage everybody that they, they are obtainable via your, your website, LSI. A concluding question, if I may. Yeah. Uh, your company yeah. today, what, what exactly are you doing with this company and who are your clients as far as you can tell? Um, uh, well, because of the pandemic, uh, we moved the class uh, to the internet and uh, we have a four day class that we do on the internet. Uh, originally, I was a little bit concerned uh, of uh, not having, uh, how you call it, face to face uh, uh, interaction with students, but I found out actually that the internet, uh, if not equal to face-to-face, -to -face, it's even better, <laughs> it's even better. And the reason is that uh, uh, it's uh, very uh, easy to get the statistics over their statements, over the statements. And, oh, and by the way, <laughs> that is to answer you about verbal versus non-verbal. Uh, it's easier to people to talk in writing than to, talk, to give information in talking. It's very interesting. Even psychologists will tell you that when they reach a, a block in the, in the sessions, they tell the patient, go back home and write it down. <laughs> they say, go back home and write it down. It's a lot easier to write than to talk. And I found out that it is a lot easier for students to talk in the chat line, that to raise their hand and to talk in public. It's a lot easier for them, <laughs> I mean, because it's not face-to-face. -face. It's not face-to-face. -face. Actually, uh, let me show you, uh, there is, um, what is the best way to get information from people? There is a book that is considered by U.S. military intelligence as a, a, a textbook on interrogation. It is called The Interrogator. It's a very interesting book. It's a book about the German Air Force interrogator who interrogated, interrogated all the American and British pilots that parachuted in Germany during the war. And what the crazy story about it 
that after the war, all the pilots got together, sponsored them to get a visa to immigrate to the U.S., and he became an American citizen. And once in a while, they had a reunion <laughs> between the pilots and the interrogator. It's a very interesting story. Anyway, all the interrogations that he did with them, he told every pilot, let's go out for a walk. As a matter of fact, if you want, and I tell my students, if you want to get uh, children, teenagers, to talk with you, you have two options. One, you take them for a walk, and one, you take them for a drive. And you need to do it more than 20 minutes. Because the first 20 minutes, they will not talk with you. But after 20 minutes, they will tell you everything. As a matter of fact, mothers who take their children to sports game will tell you when the children sit in the back of the car, they tell them everything. Because when you look at them, they will stop talking. When you don't, don't look at them, they will tell you everything. And that's exactly <laughs> when we started, verbal versus nonverbal. So actually, today my classes are on the internet. And besides that, I am now working on a major, major project uh, to go over books of celebrities, also uh, from, uh, uh, from movies, uh, politicians. How can you determine from the book if they suffered a childhood trauma in their childhood? It's very interesting point to, you can, you can determine it from a book. Uh, there are several signals that are established that they are the signals that indicate uh, 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 trauma in childhood. Uh, and what I do, I first take books that the people report that they were abused, and I see the signals, and then I go to books that people did not report that they were abused, and you still see the signals. So meaning, they didn't tell you the full story, but they give you the signals. Uh, so the, this is, a, this is a, a major, major one, because it is not just one, two books. I mean, you're talking here about many books. Uh, and uh, that's what occupy my time. Uh, when I'm not teaching. Okay, so in, in those books, just, just because I'm curious, so in these books you specifically focus on uh, childhood trauma or are you also looking if the people in a quintessential way uh, write about the truth? Well, uh, I can almost guarantee to you, <laughs> as funny as it is, <laughs> unbelievable, as funny as it is, they tell you everything. They, uh, and it, even uh, information which is very damaging. I mean, I don't want to mention name at the moment, but if you take, for example, an actress who says that her father uh, sexually abused her, and then you take the book that's written by the father, and he confirms it. I mean, he is not going to tell you I sexually abused my daughter, but, it, but that's very interesting. He will not label what he did, but he will tell you what he did. You see, most criminals do not like the label. Meaning, they will not tell you the label of what they did, but they will tell you what they did. So if you look for the label, <laughs> you always think your time. All right. But if you are looking for the activities, it's in the book. It's really in the book. And you read the book and you bang your head and you tell yourself, just a minute, this person published a book trying to present himself to the public as a very nice father, right? And he, and he confirms everything that his daughter said. If you say confirm, How I, can mean, it be? If you say cons I mean, you are a specialist. Maybe for you, it looks like the, the writer is confirming. Are you saying it's it's in plain sight confirmed, or are you it's saying it's in plain sight? Oh, okay. It's plain sight. The only difference is, I tell you what, I told you, I told you earlier. The only difference is, if you take the reports that I sent you, right? especially the the last one the, by the actor, okay, no name, by the actor. Right? So if you take uh, this one, uh, if you read it left to right, you will not see what I'm telling you. But if you will take all the book together, everything comes across. So the, the point is, the, I do not, seriously, I do not conclude anything. I base myself upon quotes. 
just quotes. Eh? Uh, and I actually, I put the posts on LinkedIn, uh, but only about quotes. I'm waiting for quotes. Every, every morning, I go over the websites, uh, several news websites, and I look for quotes. And I see a quote, then I say, aha, now I have something to look into. Okay? And some of them are really funny. I mean, they, they are talking to the public, and I don't, I really wonder if they realize what they are saying. I really wonder. That's why I'm asking you, do you think it's in plain sight? Because I have read the, the, the report that you sent me, right? And in maybe a bit naive version, I would not immediately, you know, deduce what you have deducted from it. So, yes, in retrospect, now that you have pointed it out to me, I, I can see it, yeah? But I'm, ah, I'm not yeah, sure that the, that the general public le reading that book, I'm not sure they will, you know, have your insights. Because I tell you what, they read it left to right. They read it left to right. When you read text left to right, you will not see everything. Yeah. And I don't see everything. You know how many times I go over a book? Three times. It's not my business to tell people what I think about the book. I say the writer tells us everything. That's it. And it's only a question how you put them together. Yeah. That's the point. So the, uh, you, you see... You see it's so many, uh, so many points, it's unbelievable. I mean, even a pedophile, there is a book written by a pedophile. And, and the, 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 the book is telling you, is telling you, I mean, he didn't call himself pedophile. But, but the main point is, you don't need to label. Don't look for the label. Just look for the activity. Just look for the activity. I mean, it's very interesting. People who commit crimes, they don't call it a crime. So they, they say what they did, but they don't tell you <laughs> what it is. So should I look for the label or should I look for the activity? Uh, that, that's the point. So the main point, the main point is everything is in the book. That, that's what I do. And I, I wonder if it, you can call it analysis. Uh, some of it is analysis, some, mm -hmm. but most of it, it is rearranging the book. Mm -hmm. Are you, <laughs> do you intend, let's call it analyze, books from politicians? Or you focus more on... Oh, uh, yeah, actually, actually, uh, even politicians, I do it in, on, the po in, on LinkedIn, uh, here and there. Uh, if you take, for example, the Fed, uh, when they talk about inflation, uh, and you take the Fed, and now you're talking about... Uh, economic report, all right? uh, and it is not personal, it's about the economy. But if you look what they tell you, you realize that they are misleading you. They are misleading you with the true text. Uh, what they tell you, you will never be able to nail them down because what they tell you, they will never commit themselves to anything. So the, the, the point is, um, if you take, uh, if even you take politicians, uh, 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 um, uh, I, I actually I have a book about uh, uh, President Obama, and I, I also uh, wrote about uh, President Trump. Uh, it's very interesting. The, uh, the the main point is if you listen to them strictly by the text. And don't even look at them when they are talking. <laughs> don't look at them. But if you go strictly by what they tell you, you will see that the most that they will do will be misleading you with the true story. Mm -hmm. That's the safest way. The most. The most that the, what they will do. That's the safest way. Uh, but, yeah. uh, the, but they are not lying to you. Yeah. Uh, they are not. Uh, interesting one. Um, uh, oh, by the way, uh, <laughs> let me show you. Uh, uh, Hillary... Uh, in one of the interviews many years ago, said that Bill Clinton uh, was sexually abused by his mother. She said. Uh, and by the way, she's wrong. Uh, because if you go over the book by the mother, uh, you will re realize that uh, she did injustice to the mother. The mother did not sexually abuse Clinton. Uh, but that doesn't mean he was not sexually abused. It only means that the mother didn't do it. Uh, as a matter of fact, during the first years of his life, 
he was raised by his grandmother. And even the mother, in her book, she published a book, that's how I can tell you now, uh, the mother published a book, and in the book she herself said that she wanted to kill her mother. <laughs> that's what she said. She wanted to kill her mother. Because the mother was uh, beyond being this disciplinarian. Beyond. But you, discipline. but you didn't analyze his uh, autobiography, because you can see it up by me in the background here. Uh, by the way, even in his autobiography, there mm -hmm. are signs that he was abused. Although, uh, yes, there are. Although, uh, it is, um, uh, look, it's a book of 950 pages. Uh, let me tell you, if you, uh, we are returning to the question, if the person controls language or the language controls the person. Uh, and even, let me show you, uh, let's say that he had a book editor. And the editor helped him to organize the book, to whatever. Rewrite. It doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter. If, uh, if, even if you take somebody to help you. Um, uh, by the way, take O.J. Simpson. Uh, he published a book in the middle of a trial. Uh, by the way, during the trial, he remained silent. Eh? Okay, he remained silent. But, uh, but then he published a book of 200 pages. Uh, okay, and in the book, if you not if you read correctly what it tells you, uh, for example, I tell you, I tell you, there are two denials that he uses. Number one, I did not commit the two murders. That's what he said. I did not commit the two murders. And you know what? He didn't commit the two murders because he did only one. So, but if you go to denials specifically you will see that he denies only killing one. He doesn't deny killing the other. So if you go over the book entirely, I mean, from the beginning to the end, you will realize that he denies two, but he does not deny the two individually. He denies only one individually. So now you need to go to a calculator. Two minus one equals one. So he killed only one with unknown accomplice. Unknown accomplice. Uh, and, and that's the point. So if you read the story correctly, uh, and look, he had lawyers that went over the book before he published it, but they didn't see it. They didn't see it because they read it left to right. They didn't read it from beginning to the end, 363 from above. The, the main point is nothing will help you. If you go over a story, that's the bottom line. If you read text left to right, you will lose. I can guarantee to you right now you will lose. But if you will read it 360 degrees from above, you will see what's going on. Okay. So if we, if we can conclude by summarizing certain main points that would be helpful in determining if somebody is deceptive or not, uh, looking at the verbal communication channel, right? So we have, as a first of all, people generally avoid outright lies. Right, they right. they go to omissions. They try to um, yeah skip over over sensitive information. You also said open statements. Yeah, don't ask closed questions. Ask open statements and let them in a free flow um, tell tell the story. Right. What were some other key points that you would advise in any context? Also for me, especially interesting due to my background, of course, negotiations. What would be some other key points, general ones, that do not require years of specialized training for anybody going into the next negotiation tomorrow to be aware of? Okay, I can give you uh, one point, uh, which is a major point, okay. actually. Um, and you talk about negotiations between corporations. Eh? Yeah. Okay. So what you need to to tune yourself is to the dictionary the person is using. Forget the content. You, and actually, because you are not experienced in scan, uh, so you might need two people to do it. Meaning, one to, to pay attention to the content, and one to pay attention to the vocabulary. Just the vocabulary. So for example, let me tell you, uh, I had a statement in a theft of money. Okay, theft of money. So this, the person said throughout the story, the money bag, the money bag, the money bag, and then later, 
the bag, the bag, the bag. So the money got off. Meaning, once the person changed the language from money back to bag, the money was lost already. Okay? He's telling you the money was not there because he didn't call it money back. So if you tune yourself, take for example corporation. Uh, uh, let's take a big corporation. Uh, how would you call it? Would you call it uh, the company? Or would you call it the name of the company? Uh, I mean, for example, uh, take a Starbucks. Starbucks do not want to call their employees employees. They want to call them associates. Uh, they call them associates. So uh, does the person will say associate, 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 and then once in a while he will use the word employee. I said, just a minute, what did you change? Why did you change? Throughout the story, you call them associates, now you call them employee. What's wrong in that sentence that brought you to change the language? So th that's example. Or if you, if you call uh, the company, the company, the company, and then you start to call it the name of the company. Uh, for example, let's say you take from a bank. Uh, we take a large bank, <laughs> Bank of America, okay? So uh, if you say uh, uh, an employee, and he will say the company, the company, the company, and then he will say the bank, the bank. I said, just a minute, now I wake up. I will really wake up. Why did you change? Until now it is the company, now it's the bank. What's wrong when you changed? I mean, so w what, what, let me show you what you need to realize that looking upon language, and now you ask me what brought me to, from polygraph to statements. Now, in polygraph, by the way, let me say it this way. Polygraph does not give you responses to specific questions. That's not true, by the way. Polygraph gives you comparison between responses. That's what it is. It's re comparison between responses. So polygraph tells you like this. We have the baseline. We have the baseline, the way the person responds. Okay? And then once the person changes, oh, now we wake up <laughs> because it changed. Okay, so that's called baseline versus changes. Uh, I call it in terms of language, I, I will call it average versus deviation. So if you say, for example, my car, my car, my car, my vehicle. Oh, just a minute, just a minute. I mean, till now it was a car, now it's a vehicle. What really went on in that sentence that brought it to be a vehicle? Uh, so what you, what you need to realize, and again, that's not reading left to right. That's reading top to the bottom. So once, and uh, I think in negotiations, you need to, because you are not trained in a scan, but, but you need to have two people one is paying attention to the content, and one, you alert that person to check only the language, just the language, forget the content now, just the language. So you are establishing gradually, and it takes a while to do it. I'm not saying it is, uh, you don't do it for one, two sentences, but if you are in a long session uh, of uh, negotiations, uh, pay attention to the way the person is changing because changes are not for fun. Uh, I, I will show you one simple example uh, in a small talk that I had with a student, with a student, eh? uh, during a break. Look what she said. She said, my sister goes to visit my parents this month, and I am going to visit mom and dad for Christmas. So I told her, do you realize what you did right now? They are my parents for your sister, and by, for you, they are, not, they are not my parents. They are mom and dad. And she opened her eyes, and the conversation was over. Actually, I figured that one of them, one of the parents is not biological parent for her. But they are two biological parents for her sister. So she can say, my sister is going to visit my parents, and I am going to visit mom and dad. So she is changing the language in one brief line, and she is giving you a very deep story. Very deep. I mean, practically, she gives you her past. 
Uh, so if you don't pay attention to it, you wouldn't even notice it. But if you pay attention to it, <laughs> then you realize it. Then you realize it. So you need, there are two channels of communication in uh, language. There are two. Uh, number one is the sequence of events, what you are telling me, meaning the content. And number two is the vocabulary that you use. The vocabulary is not the event anymore. If you talk in negotiations, let's say you want to sell something or you want the company to purchase company or whatever, uh, so the, 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 there are two issues. One, the way you describe your company, okay, that's not my business. I mean, I'm not into it. But, but I will be into the way you phrase the way you describe the company. And that's a different channel altogether. Different channel altogether. By the way, there was a case, a well-known case in the U.S., when the Bank of America uh, bought a, a large bank in the West. And, and they were in negotiation. Eh? And then eventually they bought the bank and they found out that the, the previous bank cheated them. That they did not, the bank was close to being bankruptcy, but they presented it as they were in good shape and all that stuff. As a matter of fact, let me show you <laughs> the fact. There was a case uh, in uh, many years ago, the chairman of America West, that was an airline that later on uh, got uh, bought by another company. And the chairman uh, was talking, and I told the stockbroker in the community in Phoenix, I told him they are going to go bankrupt. And he said, what are you talking about? He said, I went over the papers and they are in good shape and all that. I told him, listen, I'm not into paper. <laughs> I'm into listening to people. He's talking like a loser. He's going to go bankrupt. One year later, they went bankrupt. The main point is that I, I'm not dealing <laughs> with the paperwork. It, that's not my department. But my department is the language that the person uses. That's the bottom line. So the, uh, uh, in, in negotiations, because you are into negotiations, there are two different issues there. And most people do not consider the, the a vocabulary as an important channel of communication. They're not. They only consider what the person is saying, only what the person is saying. But I do pay attention to the vocabulary also. And actually, you cannot detach one from the other because the, the content will explain to you the vocabulary. The content will explain to you the vocabulary. It must be. Because like the example I gave you, when she talked about her sister, it was my parents. She talked about herself, it was mom and dad. Um, Abi Noel, um, I really appreciate your time. Oh, well, we went beyond the time. Beyond, exactly. So you were very generous. I thank you very much. I really enjoyed this uh, this conversation. Who knows? In the in the future, maybe we can uh, make a deep dive in a certain book of yours where you analyze certain interesting uh, public figures. I would be very interesting to to hear what's your next project for today. Again, thank you very much. You're welcome. You're welcome.